I'm thinking about Christmas this morning. And specifically, I'm thinking about Christmas cards. You know how it is these days that most of the cards you get are the kind that are like postcards with family pictures on them. You know, that's really all the thing these days. And by far, my favorite one that we received this year was from a young family that has a four-year-old daughter. And the design of the card didn't actually have a built-in Christmas message on it, so the family included one of their own. They quoted their daughter's explanation of the reason for the season. And I quote, Christmas, she said, is about Jesus and loving other people. Like, if they fall down, you don't laugh at them, you help them get back up. You're four years old, and you already understand compassion. There may be hope for us yet. <laughs> so this morning, what I want to do is to explore the themes of compassion and Sabbath rest. And up to this point, I've referred to both of those as well as hope and humility as clinical virtues. Perhaps more accurately and a little less conveniently, we should say that hope, humility, and compassion are the clinical virtues, but Sabbath rest is a spiritual practice that actually supports them. So in outline, what we're going to do today is return to the theme of poverty of spirit briefly as an entry point into considering the role of compassion in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. We will then look at compassion as a clinical virtue, as well as the flip side, compassion fatigue. And then the problems of burnout and compassion fatigue in the literature have led many to say how important self-care is. And what I want to do this morning is to suggest Sabbath rest as a theological complement to what we read about self-care in the clinical literature. The argument is going to be that we regularly need to take advantage of some form of Sabbath practice in order to maintain the coherence and the integrity of our narrative vocation. Now, in yesterday's lecture, I suggested that therapists who understand themselves as peacemakers might imagine themselves as those who are seeking their services as being poor in spirit. And we might add to that that this isn't just a matter of their emotional state, but rather of their social position, of the stigma and the shame and the interpersonal rejection that is often associated with needing that kind of help in the first place. And unfortunately, the problem of mental health stigma remains persistent and widespread. There was a study done by Bernice Pesco Solito, for example, who examined nationally representative data on attitudes towards mental illness in the United States across 50 years. And in the 1950s, when people were asked to describe mental illness, they usually described kind of the worst version of psychosis. Efforts to educate the public since then have helped but stigma still persists, and it persists across sociodemographic groups. Americans still see the mentally ill as prone to violence and therefore to be feared. The more severe a person's mental health issues are perceived to be, the less willing people are to associate with them. And in fact, studies using hypothetical vignettes have demonstrated that it's not just the person's behavior that elicits rejection, but the very label of mental illness itself. That already prompts people to want to move away, to distance themselves from the person in question. And unfortunately, there's also evidence that similar confusion and stigmatization exists within the church. One study, for example, recruited 85 participants who identified themselves as both Christian and mentally ill. The majority of them had suffered from mood disorders and anxiety and so on and over three quarters of them were currently in treatment. All of them had sought help from their church at least once, some of them multiple times, and what they wanted was guidance and support. But many reported that their churches failed to respond at all, or that the responses that they received were not very helpful. In fact, in some cases made the situation worse. So unhelpful responses included things like, you don't really have a mental illness which 41.2% of the people said, or, you know, you should stop taking your medication, or your illness is the result of sin, or your illness is the result of demonic activity. Now, not everyone who studies church attitudes towards mental illness, of course, will find such overtly rejecting behavior, but even then, a more general kind of stigma may persist, in which, again, people see the mentally ill as being inherently dangerous. 
And it's not helped, of course, by the sensationalist media portrayals that we'll get of troubled individuals who may have resorted to violence. That's part of the problem. Further public education may help. But even those of us who supposedly know better need to monitor our own behavior and speech more carefully. And here I have to give a, a mea culpa in that regard. I confess to you that I have done the unthinking and uh, unsensitive kind of thing to do. There was a Bible study that I was teaching. And at some point, and it was an appropriate context for saying it, but I made a joke about hearing voices. And after I did that, I realized that there were two people in the room that I knew for a fact had been hospitalized for just that. Now, these people were gracious enough to cut me some slack. But that, of course, doesn't excuse my short-sightedness in that regard. Put simply, in the calculus of the kingdom of God, the poor in spirit are deserving of our compassion. And Jesus' own teaching and healing ministry illustrate this. So consider, for example, two contrasting stories that we have from the Gospel of John. When Jesus and his disciples come across a beggar who had been born blind, the disciples treat him as a theological curiosity. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I know you probably hate it when somebody talks about you and you're sitting right there, right? That's what they're doing. Jesus sees this as an opportunity to demonstrate the power of God and what it means to be the light of the world. And so he heals the man, and the man later stands up courageously to the interrogation of the Pharisees, and he becomes a disciple of Jesus. Now contrast that then with an earlier miracle in which Jesus heals a man who had been lame for nearly 40 years. When the Jewish leaders see him, they don't see somebody who is healed by the power of God. What they see, what they see is a lawbreaker who's carrying his mat on the Sabbath. And so they demand to know, who told you to do that? But the man, of course, doesn't know who it was because Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. And later, when Jesus actually finds him and tells him to stop sinning, what the man does is he runs immediately to the Jewish authorities and tells them, it was Jesus who made me well, right? And it results directly in the persecution of Jesus. So in neither case are we told that the miracle occurred because the person actually asked to be healed. And both of those people found themselves unexpectedly embroiled in some kind of controversy. But their responses to Jesus are remarkably different. The blind beggar responds with gratitude and with worship, whereas the lame man who had been made well actually betrays the man who healed him by running to the authorities. Now, my point is that Jesus' actions were contingent neither upon receiving an appropriate request nor a properly grateful response. Rather, healing is a tangible display of Jesus' mission of compassion. Now, if it's possible to actually have favorite Greek words, one of mine would be splonchnizdomai. I just like saying the word, right? Splonchnizdomai. It's a word that suggests having a reaction in a person's bowels or innards, or if you like, in colloquial English, a gut reaction. The word is used several times in the Synoptic Gospels, and each time it either describes Jesus or it is used by Jesus to point to the compassion of God or of those who would be obedient to God. So some examples. Mark 141, the word refers to Jesus' compassion for a leper who had come to be cleansed. Matthew 20, 34, his compassion for two blind men who called out for mercy. Mark 6, the situation is the disciples are so busy with ministry that they don't even have time to eat. And so Jesus takes them away somewhere on a boat. Unfortunately, of course, the crowd's here where he's going. They run ahead on foot. And when the boat actually lands, they're confronted by the crowds again. And Mark says this is the way that Jesus responded. He had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Descriptions like that have messianic force. God's Messiah must necessarily be a man who has compassion for the downtrodden. And the point is reinforced by Jesus' parables. The Gospels use that word, splanchnistomai, to point to the compassion of God, as in the unexpected response of the father who joyfully embraces the prodigal, or the king who forgives his servant an unimaginable debt of 10,000 talents. And the word is also used to describe the compassion of the Samaritan for the man who had been robbed and beaten and left for dead by the side of the road. 
Moreover, in those latter two parables, compassion is directly associated with mercy. In Matthew, when the king upbraids the servant for <laughs> refusing to forgive a fellow servant who owed a comparatively tiny debt, he says, should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And then in Luke, when Jesus asked the lawyer to tell him who had been a neighbor to the robbery victim, the lawyer is forced to respond, the one who showed him mercy. And don't forget the two blind men in Matthew. They cried out for mercy, and what they received was compassionate healing. All of that, then, is background to why it is that when I hear Jesus say, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, what I hear is the virtue of compassion. The poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, they're all honored. Again, not because of the intrinsic goodness of their state of being, but because of the goodness and mercy of God. Jesus then says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The words hunger and thirst echo the theme of powerlessness again, but again with a twist. What they desire is righteousness, or perhaps even better, justice. The people who hunger for justice are the ones who recognize God's mercy to the weak. They long to see God make things right. And it's at that point in the Beatitudes that Jesus takes an outward turn and says, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Those who hunger for justice, those who hunger for God to make things right, those who want to be peacemakers are those who strive to embody the mercy and the compassion of God themselves. And in return, they receive an eschatological promise. One day, the thing that they long to see done will be done. Now, most therapists, I would assume, are motivated by some degree of compassion. The way that psychologist Kristen Neff has described it is the recognition and clear seeing of suffering combined with an empathic desire to help. And for Christians who view themselves as peacemakers, the virtue of compassion would take on an additional meaning. They would see the psychological poverty of their clients and respond with humility and compassion. The continued cultivation of compassion, conversely, would help them to stay attuned to the need in the first place. And in eschatological hope, they would envision their clinical work as being taken up into God's ongoing ministry of mercy, and they would take heart at every sign of shalom that they are privileged to witness, however small it might be. Now, therapists might also think of compassion as being expressed in the hospitality that they show to their clients by providing safe and welcoming spaces. After all, early Christians were known for their hospitality in the ancient world. They drew upon the story of Abraham, who entertained strangers and entertained them lavishly without realizing that he was actually entertaining the Lord himself. They may remember Moses speaking of a God who executes justice for the orphan and for the widow, and who commanded God's people to love the strangers, for you yourselves were strangers in Egypt. And of course, they remembered the teaching of Jesus, who declared this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at the left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you are there blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Those who are blessed by the king are those who welcome strangers, who offered compassion and hospitality 
to the least of these, without knowing that they were ministering by proxy to the king himself. And they did it because it was the right thing to do, not because they were expecting to be rewarded. So what might a clinical embodiment of hospitality actually look like? One suggestion, of course, would be to consider the physical space in which therapy occurs. Is it warm and welcoming, or is it filled with symbols of the therapist's power? But hospitality is also about the quality of the therapeutic relationship itself. A judicious use of self-disclosure, for example, can be an act of hospitality. It's a way of welcoming, welcoming someone into the messiness of our own lives without having to tidy up the living room first. Now, none of this is meant to suggest that it's a simple matter to maintain a consistently compassionate or hospitable stance. Because those who study, study stress and trauma frequently re refer to the experience of what's known as compassion fatigue. As Charles Figley explains it, the very act of being compassionate and empathic extracts a cost under most circumstances. In our effort to view the world from the perspective of the suffering, we suffer. The meaning of compassion is to bear suffering. Compassion fatigue, like any other kind of fatigue, reduces our capacity or our interest in bearing the suffering of others. Now for therapists, part of the difficulty has to do with the simple fact that some clients are easier to work with than others. Some are more likable and others constrain the patience of even the most seasoned practitioner. Jeff Kotler, for example, has painted a somewhat tongue-in-cheek composite portrait of what many therapists might consider to be the ideal client, quote, they are bright, vibrant, and interesting people. They're professionals. They're reasonably healthy, have no underlying personality disorder, and present symptomatology that is easy to treat. <laughs> they are highly motivated to change, yet are patient enough to wait for results. <laughs> they have a great capacity for developing insight, can tolerate ambiguity, and have a high threshold for dealing with uncertainty. They are verbally expressive, creative thinkers who present vivid material, rich in detail and symbolism. They are socially skilled and responsible. They show up on time, pay their bills promptly, and offer to pay for cancellations. <laughs> they would never call therapists at home or bother us between sessions unless they had a genuine emergency. They are appropriately deferential toward and respectful of our position. They are also very grateful for our help. Many of you probably wish you had clients like that. Ironically, of course, one wonders why they need a therapist in the first place. <laughs> sort of sounds like a good self-help book would just do it, right? The reality, of course, is that our clients and our caseloads are not quite like that. Ostensibly, clients come seeking help but their persistent behavior, both during and between sessions, often leaves therapists wondering if they want to change or are capable of changing. And some clients, in fact, seem bent on defeating their therapists actively or passively as if needing to demonstrate that therapy actually won't do them any good. Therapists may run the gamut of emotions working with them, from exasperation to boredom, struggling with doubts about their own competence, feeling their compassion stretch to the limit. But even with the most cooperative and grateful of clients, there is still a personal price to be paid when one is expected to continually empathize with suffering, particularly when working with trauma survivors. At the extremes, in a phenomenon known as vicarious traumatization, therapists and other helpers can be traumatized themselves by the exposure. And even in less severe cases, helpers may still experience what's called secondary traumatic stress. Working empathetically with traumatic material puts a strain on the helper's emotional state and their ability to cope, and may lead to symptoms similar to post-traumatic stress disorder. And even when therapists are not working extensively with trauma, they must still deal with the significant personal demands that are intrinsic to the vocation. Therapists and other helping professionals are subject to burnout, a negative emotional state which can arise in virtually any work setting in which you have too much to do, too few resources, and not enough in the way of a sense of control over your situation. Therapists in one study, for example, spoke of forgetting things that needed to be done, being plagued by intrusive thoughts, losing sleep, and becoming less patient and more agitated with other people. 
We can think of compassion fatigue as the unfortunate combination of both burnout and secondary traumatic stress. It's a perfect storm of work characteristics that drains therapists of their ability to sustain compassion. Now, relatively speaking, research on compassion fatigue is still in its early stages. A recently published review article, however, examined 32 studies on compassion fatigue in mental health professionals, and three main risk factors were identified. The first and most important one was, of course, their trauma history. This has to do with whether or not therapists have trauma in their own personal background. The second factor is empathy, and that moderated that relationship. In other words, therapists who were more empathetic to begin with and who had trauma in their backgrounds were more likely to experience compassion fatigue. Third factor is caseload. That's a pretty obvious one. The more trauma that you actually deal with in your caseload, case the more likely you are to experience compassion fatigue. And fourth and finally, they also identified positively a possible protective factor of mindfulness. Because those who are, have the ability to be able to non-judgmentally be aware of their own cognitions, their own mental and emotional state, have lower compassion fatigue scores. <clears throat> so it's with findings like that in mind that many people then emphasize how crucial self-care is for therapists, and by extension, for the well-being of anyone whom they serve. So before moving into a discussion of self-care and Sabbath, though, I want to circle back to the clinical virtues of hope and humility. Because again, our clients have been humbled by life, and they come seeking hope which they find in part through our compassionate care. Now that may be particularly true of those who live with trauma, but the research on burnout and compassion fatigue suggests that compassion, which is perhaps the most intuitively obvious of the clinical virtues, needs to be sustained by our own hope and humility. It's not just a matter of approaching clinical work humbly, it's a matter of how we respond when the work humbles us. And if it hasn't yet, trust me, it will. <laughs> Cultivating the clinical virtues entails changing the way we think, and it entails engaging our eschatological imagination. People who work with compassion fatigue from a cognitive behavioral point of view, for example, note that one of the risk factors is a therapist's potentially unrealistic or irrational cognitions. So I want you to take a look at this list and just ask yourself the question of whether or not these things may be true of you. So it includes beliefs about their clients, such as the following. My clients should not be difficult, resistant, or challenging. They should work as hard as I do to make treatment work. All my client sessions should be as the textbooks describe. I should never be disrespected or criticized by a client. Clients should be motivated to change and to fully engage in treatment. And I should be loved and admired by my clients. Now, on the other side, we also have unhelpful beliefs about ourselves and our work, including one or more of the following. I must be successful with all my clients. If I'm not successful in alleviating clients' problems, I can't feel good about myself. I should not dislike any of my clients. I should have all the answers. I should not have any emotional reactions myself. And if I do, I should control them and never show this to clients or colleagues. My worth as a person is dependent on my job performance. I will be seen as weak if I ask for help. Other people should see things my way. I must be perceived as totally competent. Now, that's not, of course, say that we're consciously aware of holding such beliefs, because if I ask you directly whether or not you believe that your clients will never disrespect you or that you should have all the answers, you're going to tell me, no, of course not. Right? But the real question is how you respond when a client does, in fact, disrespect you sometimes rather egregiously, or when you find that you don't have the answer that you think you should have, and you feel a little bit lost. The vocation of entering into the suffering of others with sustained compassion places a heavy personal demand on therapists, and those who hold those kinds of beliefs are less likely to engage in appropriate self-care. It takes humility to acknowledge that we need help. And for Christians, it takes hope to keep humility in its proper eschatological context. What gives us hope is the knowledge that God not only champions those who are poor in spirit and mourning and meek, but he calls them 
to participate in the work of making peace through the ministry of compassion. We can be humbled by the work we do and by our seeming failures without having to believe that this somehow disqualifies us from the vocation. And again, even in the most difficult of sessions, we can draw encouragement from each moment of shalom as a sign of our participation in the peacemaking work of God. And thus we return to a discussion of self-care and its relationship to Sabbath practice. Figley reminds us that it is often the simplest of strategies that makes the greatest difference. And some of those strategies have already been implied by what I've said, and it's echoed in the self-care literature. We need to recognize the risks and demands of what we do. We need to watch out for unrealistic cognitions. We need to seek therapy as needed. And sometimes what we need to do is to diversify our caseload. If you were to ask Kristen Neff, she would say we also need to learn what self-compassion means. We need to be mindful of our distress. We need to treat ourselves with kindness instead of criticism. And we need to recognize that suffering and failure are part of our shared human condition. As the authors of one recent study have found, therapists who were higher in self-compassion were less likely to experience burnout or compassion fatigue. Some trauma therapists were asked about their self-care strategies, and they mentioned things like debriefing with other people, engaging in activities to alleviate or manage stress, such as socializing with friends, spending time with family, finding enjoyable ways to get exercise. They also mentioned the importance of spirituality, of being guided and sustained by something larger than themselves. And you see similar recommendations in an article that was written specifically for marital and family therapists. They wrote this, Engaging in lighthearted conversation, watching comedy entertainment, practicing religion, and participating in non-competitive activities or hobbies may also reduce stress and increase happiness. The overall idea is to avoid stress, increase relaxation, and be part of a world that does not mirror that of the therapeutic setting. Now, I affirm the practical suggestions contained in these two sentences, but at the same time, however, I'm a little concerned about the implications of listing religion in the same breath as watching funny movies and having hobbies. <laughs> because if Sabbath practice becomes nothing more than an escape from the stress of our jobs, it may fail at helping us to cultivate a right sense of vocation. <clears throat> In both Exodus and Deuteronomy, the injunction to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy is the fourth and the longest of the Ten Commandments. But I suspect that many American Christians have a very ambivalent relationship to the notion of commandment in the first place. We cherish our freedom. And freedom often means not having to do anything that we don't really want to do unless it's absolutely necessary. So we honor the Ten Commandments in principle, but in practice, the fourth commandment is either treated as one of the unnecessary ones or it's transmuted into a strongly worded recommendation that we get ourselves to church on Sunday. I also realize that some of you here may have grown up with legalistic Sabbath traditions that you resented as a child. Why don't I get to play like every other kid does? Let me assure you that I am not trying to pressure anyone to adopt some new set of rules that have no personal resonance. But I do want to put before you the possibility of receiving Sabbath as a gift. Think, for example, the story of manna in the wilderness. God provided food for his people because they needed it to survive. And every day they were to go out and gather as much as they needed for their families and not keep it overnight because it would spoil. No manna was given on the seventh day because that was the day of rest. And so people were commanded to gather a double portion on the sixth day with a promise that it would not spoil. And so the people went out to do the work of gathering on the seventh day. And then God has to say through Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you food for two days. So here there is both commandment and gift. The Lord gives food, and the Lord gives Sabbath rest, providing for both the physical and the spiritual well-being of his people. Commandment and gift are not incompatible when the covenant love of God is their source. Or consider, of course, the words of Jesus. The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That, of course, is the response that Jesus gave to the Pharisees who were criticizing his hungry disciples for picking grain on the Sabbath. 
And I suspect that some of us, if we read that text steeped in individualistic values, might hear Jesus as saying something like this. Don't you go quoting your rules to me. I'm the boss here. I have more authority than you do. And these guys are with me and I say it's okay. And if we read it that way, then we just say, Jesus has won another argument with the Pharisees. Good for him. Freedom triumphs over legalism. Let's move on. But again, we may have missed the possibility of receiving a gift. The Sabbath was made for humankind in a way that assures that our hunger will be fed. Still, Sabbath rest can be a hard sell. I once spoke on the subject of rest at another seminary to a group of students and local pastors. And at the end of the presentation, one of the pastors stood up. It was like what Brad is saying, you know, are you going to ask a question or, <laughs> or are you going to make a comment? And what the pastor said was really more of a declaration than a question. It was, so do you mean to tell me that I'm supposed to ask my congregation to give me a day off when they're working so hard in the church themselves? In some congregational cultures, rest is neither a commandment nor a gift. It's a sign of spiritual laziness, of shirking responsibility, of being shamefully selfish. Or to use another one of Brueggemann's metaphors, we sometimes act as if we were still slaves in Egypt commanded to make bricks without straw. We can neither give ourselves nor each other permission to rest, whatever the commandment might say. Now, the pressures of work are both internal and external. There are things to be done, obligations to fulfill that vary with our stage and station in life. Leisure time and the freedom to be able to decide what we do with our days off can be marks of economic privilege. Some people literally can't afford to take a day off. And even when we have such freedom, we can put pressure on ourselves, feeling like we don't get to rest, we don't deserve to rest until all of our work is done. But the reality for responsible people is that our work is never done. If we wait for our work to be done before we have earned our rest, we won't rest to the detriment of body and soul. Dorothy Bass quotes the wonderfully wise words of a teacher who is musing with her colleagues about work and rest. Conscientious teachers, as we know, are never done with work. There's always something else to do. There's more lesson planning. There's more grading. There's a hundred of other tasks that take up their evenings and their weekends. But this teacher decided that she needed to take a stand. And so she said this, show me a person who can't get their work done in six days, and I'll show you a person who can't get it done in seven. <laughs> Sabbath rest is not simply the religious equivalent of a day off from work. The very notion of a day off is a negative one, suggesting the need to escape our brick making for the sake of our sanity. If we have the means, we vacate, we get away, and then we return to the same job, perhaps slightly better rested, but with the same attitude. This is not Sabbath rest. We may enjoy leisure activities on the Sabbath, but Sabbath rest is not to be identified with leisure. It's not simply an opportunity to get away from work, to do things to recharge our batteries, but to cultivate a right relationship to our work. It's an opportunity to remember who we are, the beloved children of a God who blesses the poor in spirit, who feeds those who wander in the desert. We need to be secure in that identity in order to be rightly related to our work. Toward that end, Abraham Heschel insists that the Sabbath, quote, is a day in which we abandon our plebeian pursuits and reclaim our authentic state, in which we may partake of a blessedness in which we are what we are, regardless of whether we are learned or not, of whether our career is a success or a failure. It is a day of independence of social conditions. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that Christian therapists ignore the advice offered in the literature on self-care, burnout, and compassion fatigue, and I'm not denigrating the value of play, relaxation, or diversion. But as Christians, we need more than just escape or distraction, more than just a day of vacation or binge-watching on Netflix. Sabbath rest is not simply about forgetting work, but about remembering who God is and who we are as a consequence. We need a regular discipline that will help us to remember that our worth is not defined by our work, 
that our value is not measured by our productivity. And this, I fear, is an occupational hazard for working professionals. I was thinking about this recently while teaching my way through the Gospel of John on Sunday mornings. Jesus has just washed his disciples' feet, and he's bidding them farewell. He's trying to prepare them for what's coming next. And he promises not to leave them as orphans, and he promises to give them the Holy Spirit. And then he proclaims the last of the great I am sayings in the Gospel of John. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and that, like a branch that withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown in the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Drawing upon Old Testament imagery, Jesus is the true vine because he is the true embodiment of all that the people of God had always been meant to be. Now, there is a legitimate element of warning in what Jesus says. Some branches may be cut away and thrown into the fire because of their lack of proper fruit. Now, perhaps that's why that pastor was so upset with me for suggesting that people in ministry need to honor the commandment to rest. Aren't we always supposed to be about the business of producing fruit? Who wants to be chopped off and burned? But Jesus is trying to comfort his disciples, not threaten them. He's promising a continuing relationship with them, a relationship of love and joy. And though it is true that Jesus wants them to bear fruit, he does not actually command them to do so. He commands them instead to abide in him and in his love even as he promises to abide in them. They are branches, their very life draws upon the vine. So he's not saying, if you don't bear fruit, you'll be thrown on the fire. What he's saying is, if you don't abide, you will wither, and then what use will you be? That's not a threat, but it is a warning. And it's on the order of telling someone, if you don't eat, you're gonna die. So much of my professional life and consciousness, and probably yours as well, is about productivity. As a teacher, I'm always working on the next lecture, the next Bible lesson, the next speaking engagement. As a minister, it's the next sermon or wedding or memorial service. As a writer, it's the next article or book or blog post. I'm not a list maker by nature, but I'm forced to make lists just to keep track of my responsibilities and commitments. And some part of my brain is always thinking about the next thing on the list. I wake up at night and start thinking about the projects I'm working on. I'm crafting sentences in my head. I'm trying to hang on to ideas that I want to remember in the morning, and I'm unable to sleep because I can't turn off my brain. Now, I understand the need to be fruitful, as Jesus said, the Father is glorified when we bear much fruit. But to be completely honest, I'm not always sure about my motivation. How much do I pursue fruitfulness for the sake of the Father's glory as opposed to my own? To what extent do I feel the need to be productive in order to have a sense of personal worth? As Christian professionals, sometimes we take on project after project for egoistic reasons, and we convince ourselves that it's all for God. How can we know the difference? Well, here's a litmus test. How good are we at abiding? Personally, I'm really good at finding new things to put on lists, but I'm not quite as adept at abiding. Am I the only one? A regular practice of Sabbath rest may help us recognize that the things on our to-do lists are not themselves the fruit. At best, they are means of fruit bearing, 
through which we might see the spread of love and joy and, yes, peace. And if we're to enjoy the gift of Sabbath, we will need to move in two directions. The enjoyment of Sabbath rest entails both a thou shalt not and a thou shalt. Thou shalt not, of course, work, which sounds simple enough as a concept, but can be difficult to put into practice. How do you know what is and what isn't work? If you're in paid Christian ministry and regularly read and study the scripture and theology, is that work? And therefore to be avoided on the Sabbath? Those are the kinds of puzzles that we run into when we make Sabbath only a matter of behavior and not of the spirit. But therapists who teach time and stress management to their clients know that we must commit to some behavioral boundaries or nothing's going to change. So we do have to firmly and consistently say no to some things in order to say yes to others. But Sabbath rest is not guaranteed by having a don't do list. Our work activities are not the problems in themselves. The issue is our relationship to our work. To what extent have we effectively begun to worship productivity or some other form of success to give it the allegiance that belongs only to God? Or to what extent have the rhythms and assumptions of the work week come to define how we approach life overall? Sabbath is consecrated time, but how can we experience the sacredness of time when we're accustomed to perceiving it in terms of the 50-minute billable hour? We establish boundaries, therefore, in order to define a space of freedom in which our worth is not defined by what we do. During designated Sabbath time, therefore, I try to stay away from activities that feel like personal or professional accomplishments, anything that might belong on a to-do list or contribute another line to my vita. I don't send or answer email. I try to avoid anything that draws me back into what I like to call the measured life, all the different ways in which we daily quantify how well our lives are supposedly going. I don't step on the bathroom scale. I don't wear my fitness tracker. I'm wearing it right now, but on the Sabbath, I won't. I don't use apps that chart my progress in some way, and I stay off of social media because all of these link my worth in some way to measurable goals. Blessed are the slim. (laughs) Blessed are the active. Blessed are those whose feet are firmly planted on the paths of self-improvement. And blessed are you when people like you and follow you and post all kinds of emojis on your Facebook page. (laughs) Rejoice and be glad, for in this way you know that your life matters. Do we know the extent to which our daily habits and practices, even those that are supposedly for our own benefit, draw us away from the awareness that we are deeply and truly loved by a God who champions the poor in spirit. We say no then in order to make room for yes. But yes to what? Well, rest, of course. By all means, take that much needed nap. As Marva Dawn has suggested, however, Sabbath is not just about ceasing and resting, but about what she calls embracing and feasting. We embrace the truth of what we believe and we seek to live it out. We feast on hope and the joy that comes with it. A day of rest can be more than just an escape from stress. It's an opportunity to be renewed in hope by abiding in the love of Christ. When Jesus speaks of abiding, surely he means something less like discrete behaviors and more like a disposition. And if that's so, we should ask ourselves what disciplines we might need to form such a disposition. And what I'm suggesting to you, of course, is that Sabbath is one of those disciplines. The deliberate, habitual practice of setting aside a time that is regularly consecrated to God in which we may enjoy both rest and renewal. Here's another way to think of it. Early family therapists made a great deal out of the concept of homeostasis, a term coined by physiologist Walter Cannon in the years before or the years after World War I. It refers to all the ways in which the human body automatically tries to maintain itself in a state of constancy and equilibrium. So in the dead of winter or in the height of summer, for example, our bodies work to maintain a core temperature that doesn't vary by more than a couple of degrees all year. And we remain entirely unaware of the processes involved. One physician recently summed up how revolutionary the idea of homeostasis was at the time it was introduced. Quote, Cannon's insight inverted long-established logic. Physiologists for generations had described animals as assemblages of machines, 
Muscles were motors, the heart a pump, the nerves electrical conduits. The emphasis was on movement, on actions, on work. Don't just stand there, do something. Canon had fundamentally changed our conception of how the human body works. A major point of physiological activity, paradoxically, was to enable stasis. Don't just do something, stand there. I wonder if we need to have our logic inverted as well. Could it be that the God who created humanity knows what we need to maintain our spiritual homeostasis? Do we constantly push ourselves out of equilibrium by the way that we work, or even by the way that we think about work? Because if so, then don't just do something, stand there. When you leave the auditorium uh, this morning, uh, I want you to be able to pick up a, a gift that my wife and I have made up for you. There's a Jewish tradition, and no, I'm not Jewish, but I like the tradition. There's a Jewish tradition where when the Sabbath day actually ends, the family will take a box of fragrant spices and pass it around so that everyone can take a deep breath of those spices. The idea is that not only are you enjoying the aroma of the Sabbath day, but you are to take the memory of that aroma and carry it with you into the rest of the week. And the hope is that over time what will happen is that aroma will begin to infuse all of what we do throughout the week, that our work will have the aroma of Sabbath to it. So when you leave, you'll be able to pick up a little kit that looks like this, and you'll have to put it together yourself or make a little sachet of both cinnamon and cloves. I don't know about you, I love cinnamon and cloves. It makes me happy whenever I smell that. So this is for you, and I hope you'll use it for your own Sabbath. There's no one-size-fits-all formula for Sabbath rest, but we might begin by honestly pondering a few questions. What helps us let go of performance anxiety or shame and to accept, once again, the compassionate love of God? What helps us to marvel at the grace and majesty of God and to trust God's wisdom and sovereignty? How might we enjoy the goodness of God's creation or the company of people in our lives who know our faults and weaknesses but love us anyway? Sabbath can be a time to prayerfully practice whatever helps us to regain our perspective and equilibrium, to get a firmer hold on our vocation. Again, to quote Marva Dawn, if we become people of peace through the intentionality of our Sabbath keeping, then we will, out of that character of peacemaking, live in a way that promotes peace. To be a psychotherapist is to enter compassionately into the secret suffering of others over and over and over again and to carry the burden of holding that suffering in trust. We are privy to the best and the worst of the human spirit. And we can't do such work with any degree of empathy without being affected by it. We need the hope of knowing that the healing ministry into which we have entered belongs first and foremost to God, who has already promised a new heaven and a new earth, a day in which death and sorrow and pain will be no more. That work of renewal has already begun, and we have the privilege of being part of it. Today, that work remains incomplete. And we must strive to be the most caring and competent therapist we can be, but even then, we will not be able to help every client. This will humble us and perhaps even feel like failure. But in that humiliation, we have the opportunity to learn true humility. The humility of knowing that there is but one savior and we ain't it. We have the opportunity of learning to notice and rejoice in every manifestation of shalom in our clients' lives, not as a sign of our clinical brilliance, but as a sign that grace is a living and ever-present reality, even in a broken world. We have the opportunity to be renewed in our compassion, particularly if we deliberately set aside Sabbath time to abide in the love and mercy of Christ. We are peacemakers, the children of God who mirror the compassion of God as we play midwife to moments of shalom in the lives of our clients. That is our calling, the primary vocation that is embodied in and through our clinical work with those who are downtrodden in spirit. May we embrace that vocation with whole hearts and integrated imaginations. Thank you. Thank you.